Um, I'm going to be talking about Super Soul, which is my latest book. Uh, I've been researching for about the last 18 months. And I think the thing I would most like to impress upon you, if it had to be one sentence, it would be that we are all, every single one of you, and all of us throughout the whole world, no matter what our circumstances, we are the creator gods. Nobody else outside of us. We are part of a consciousness, which I refer to as a super soul consciousness, which is so divine that it makes every single one of us absolutely a creator god. Now, in order to understand that properly, I'd like to just take you back to where I've come from in the past, and certainly where a huge number, I think, of Western spiritual seekers probably also come from, which is a position where we tend to think of uh, what I would call perhaps the um, linear growth model of the soul. So we think many of us, or have thought in terms of a soul having many lives and having one life after the other in a reasonably linear fashion and growing from one life to the next um, and experiencing different things, and etc, etc, etc. And the big thing that hit me when I first started researching this, and it came about because I met a, a very good friend, uh, who's a good friend now, a chap called Todd Akamesis, who's a, a, a well-known out-of-body researcher. And Todd started talking to me at a party a couple of years ago about how when he'd been out of body, he'd gone to some very high vibrational frequency realms. And several times he'd encountered this being, which was incredibly divine, incredibly wise, um, so divine and, and the vibration was so high that in fact he was almost uh, 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 couldn't be in its presence to start with. Um, and then after repeated encounters with this being, he came to realize it was just another aspect of his own consciousness. And despite the fact that initially he could have easily have thought it was God or Jesus or whatever you want to think of it, this was actually just another aspect of himself. And to me, that was an incredible revelation because where I come from, and I think many people come from, we have this idea, okay, um, our higher self, if you like, or the core soul essence of us, maybe this higher self or this soul aspect of ourselves has a view of all of our different past lives. Um, but that's probably as far as we go with it. What Todd was talking about in terms of this being was of an order of divinity and power and wisdom which is way beyond what most of us would normally think about in terms of soul consciousness, our own soul consciousness. And so I started doing more research and I was able to establish, Todd put me on to the fact that the very famous out-of-body researcher Robert Monroe in fact makes reference to these kind of levels of his own consciousness. He doesn't do it in his most famous first book, uh, which is Journeys Out of the Body, but in his second and third books, where actually are much more interesting, he does talk about this uh, kind of very high level of consciousness of his own. Ledbetter was talking about the monad, um, I think, and he was talking about what he referred to as astral clairvoyance. Uh, but in actual fact, I'm pretty sure that what he was talking about there was out-of-body experiences, just like modern people would talk about, modern pioneers would talk about, um, and uh, when he was talking about the monad, I think there's a good chance he was talking about what I would refer to as this super soul level of consciousness. And many other modern out of body pioneers that I've been in touch with have this same, whether they have it in their books or not, they've confirmed to me separately that they have this view as well about this very high level of consciousness that they all are part of. And we're not talking about source or the universal consciousness, whatever you might want to uh, refer to that as, this is still an identifiably individual consciousness, but of great supreme power, and it's part of all of us, or we're all part of our own super soul. And of course that also means that when we hear religious reports of, uh, uh, in the Bible for example, of, of various of the prophets meeting you know, with God and God was so shiny and, uh, that they couldn't possibly uh, look, at, uh, look upon him and had to turn their eyes away, you can pretty much guarantee that this would have been some sort of an out-of-body experience or altered state experience where they may well have just been meeting another aspect of their own super soul consciousness, not God at all. In fact, the definition of super soul that I've put together, 
and it's a slightly long one, so I haven't fully memorised it. I'll just read it out for you. Um, but it gives you a proper view of exactly what I'm talking about. A super soul is a grouping of hundreds, maybe thousands, of souls. Myriads of super souls are projecting them, uh, individual soul aspects of themselves into this and myriad other realities, meaning that they're very far from the ultimate consciousness of souls. Yet to be fully connected to your super soul is to have boundless wisdom and creative power. And as a full holographic representation of it, you are already more divine than you can hope to conceive. Divine enough even to nullify further specific, uh, uh, speculation about what lies beyond. So I think there's also a pretty good chance that if you hear people talking about when they've been either in outer body states or other altered states, reaching a nirvanic plane or some sort of plane where they, they might even describe themselves as somehow being in the presence of source and re-merging with source and the universal consciousness, I would be, I'm not a betting man as it turns out, but I would be prepared to lay pretty good money that they are actually only at the level of consciousness of their super soul because that's how divine and powerful it is and it would create that kind of impression of unity. The other aspect of this is that this uh, idea is talked about in a variety of channeled material as well. Um, Going right back, the earliest reference to it I could find was in the channelings of Geraldine Cummins, who some of you may have heard of uh, channelling Frederick Myers in the 1930s. Frederick Myers was a very famous uh, psychic explorer. He uh, set up the uh, British uh, Society for Psychical Research in the late 19th century. And Myers came through to Geraldine Cummins in the 30s, and some of what he talks about in his channeled messages is very much along the lines of Super Soul. And various other ones, Seth, many of you will have heard of, who Jane Roberts channeled, uh, Gildas, slightly lesser known, the Michael teachings, fairly well known, even Neil Donald Walsh's God. At one point in the first book of, Neil Don of Conversations with God, uh, whatever this entity is that Neil Donald Walsh is talking to, says, just as you are my children, I am the child of another. In other words, and, and Walsh says, what, you mean you're not God? And he the, the answer is sort of slightly evaded, but it, it, it makes it pretty clear that he wasn't talking to any sense of an ultimate consciousness at all. And again, if I was a betting man, I'd lay pretty good money that he was just talking to his own super soul level of consciousness. The reason, by the way, that I've chosen to use this word super soul is because words like higher self and over soul, which are often used by outer body explorers, um, and they're, by the way, very used to this idea of the power of their own, what they would call over-soul or higher self. Um, but uh, in normal sort of past life regression circles, when we refer to the higher self, for example, we just mean our soul, the, the, the relatively limited level of our soul. word paramatma, which loosely speaking translates as source or the universal consciousness. So, again, neither of those words, there was too much confusion surrounding what is exactly meant by words like oversoul and higher self, so that in the end, um, and, and indeed, of course, this word super soul was gifted to me, as many of these things are, from another level of my consciousness, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and it does have a certain ring to it, and it does, of course, really try and express what I'm trying to get at, which is just how powerful a consciousness we are all part of, individually. The other thing I will say about this is that it does require us to turn a number of things, uh, ideas that we may have got used to in the past, on their heads. I personally come, I've spent 10 years researching past lives and putting together evidence for reincarnation um, and using this fairly simplistic model of linear lives one after the other and soul growth from one life to the next. Um, one of my specialisms was in what I call interlife or life between lives research. And in a book that I wrote some years ago called The Big Book of the Soul, I compared all of the original pioneering interlife reports from all of the pioneering psychologists who did this kind of work back in the 60s, 70s and early 80s when it wasn't very well known. And all of their subjects were talking about the same kind of things. And one of the things in particular that they would talk about in this interlife state between one life and the next was reviewing the life you've just left as a past life review and then planning the next one. 
And this is, I always thought that was an incredibly powerful idea that we're responsible for all the things that happen to us in our lives as part of the challenges that we're going to face to help us to grow by having different experiences. But guess what? One of the strongest messages that comes out now, and we've known about this for a long time, is that if we are having multiple lives, if we do reincarnate, all of those lives are happening at the same time. We might be incarnating into different eras, but effectively, because time doesn't really exist in the continuous way that we think it does, they are all happening at the same time. And I'm absolutely convinced by that now. And I, just like many other people, have been guilty of sweeping that under the carpet and kind of going, well, I'm not really sure how that works, so I'd better just ignore it. But I don't think we can ignore it anymore. Indeed, the subtitle of the book here is It's a Radical Worldview for a New Consciousness. And as part of this shift that we're going through now, it seems to me that a big part of this is growing up a little bit and having some more sophisticated models of soul consciousness that we now work with may well be, then the implication is, for example, you can't talk about next life planning. It doesn't mean anything because they're all happening at the same time. You can talk about life planning, but not next life planning. And the implication of that is that if there is some kind of planning behind our lives, it's got to be done by some sort of level of consciousness outside of space-time. And guess what? That's exactly where your super soul level of consciousness would reside, outside of space-time, so that it can see all of your lives. In fact, it, there are wonderful descriptions from some of the out-of-body pioneers that I've used in the book, which describe how you know, a, a, an oversoul consciousness itself being channeled and saying, you know, I send all of these different parts of myself out as probes to have these different experiences. And I'm monitoring the experiences all the time, on a real-time, eternal now basis. So we need to think about life planning in a different way than we, and a more sophisticated way than we have done in the past. We need to understand that the interlife, or the life between lives as I've called it in the past, and, and these are all ideas that I've hung on to very hard, I've invested a huge amount in them, but we have to be prepared to let things go sometimes. It's not an interlife at all. It's an afterlife. It may just be what you might call a paralife. You know, in other words, what we're doing in the spirit realms after our life is over may well be running in parallel with what we're doing right now. I mean, these ideas get very difficult to comprehend with a human brain, but it's the logical implication of what we're saying. So that's point number one. And I will also mention just briefly a different model of consciousness, which I call the single life matrix model, super soul matrix model. And this was based on some channeled material by a gentleman called Frank DeMarco. And I've never come across this kind of material before. And when I first came across it, just as I was getting near the end of this book, my initial reaction was to run away from it. I, it, it, it was, a, it was a, an attraction and a repulsion all at the same time because it turned my ideas upside down so completely that I wanted to run away. And yet on the other hand, there was something about it that was resonating and I knew I couldn't run away completely. This model suggests that we actually effectively just have one life each. Uh, and what it says is that in some sense you might have past life personalities who donate certain psychological and emotional traits to a new soul, and I use the words past and new um, in inverted commas because again I'm sure this is all happening effectively in the eternal now. But so past souls effectively donate traits to a new soul, but they don't donate them just to one new soul. A past soul can donate its traits to any number of new souls within the super soul collective. So if that model's correct, it doesn't make any sense to say my past lives or my karma. It doesn't mean anything. It's the collectives. And when you get into that model and start th using that as a way of living, it, de it generates a completely altruistic way of looking at life. The phrase I use is that you see yourself as a, uh, a, a member of Team Super Soul um, operating at the coalface of space-time and gaining experience here on behalf of the collective. You know, I mean, you can even use the phrase that's common these days, taking one for the team. You know, if you're having difficulty, it may have nothing to do with, oh, I've been bad in a past life and I've got to pay a price for it. That's nonsense. You're just taking on an experience on behalf of the collective and you just do the best with it that you can. 
So these are all more sophisticated ways of looking at models of soul consciousness. I discussed them in a lot of detail with diagrams, and they're not easily explained without diagrams, but they're all obviously in the book. Um, but I will just leave you then with the parting thought that we are all creator gods. We have incredible power and majesty. The greatest message that comes through from all of the channel sources that I've been reading over the last year or so, they all say, understand and remember indeed exactly who you are. Stop thinking of yourself as this limited, tiny little being that things just happen to all the time. You are a being of infinite majesty. And there's no, there's no, it's completely democratic. It's not some of us are great because we're more further along down the path than others. We are all beings of infinite majesty. And we need to just remember that. And what comes with that also is an understanding that we create everything that we experience. Bar nothing, we create everything that we experience from some level of our own consciousness. Now that might sometimes be from the super cell level, but nevertheless, one way or another, we create everything. That means a huge responsibility on us. And not everybody is ready to take that responsibility and realize just how much they're responsible for everything. But if you are ready to take that responsibility, then the plus side of the coin is that genuinely you are so powerful that you can move mountains, literally. And that's the most, the, the most important part of the message that I'd like to leave you with. Thank you.